Good morning and welcome to our morning prayers from St Peter's Ipsley being brought to you online this Monday morning. My name is Peter McLaren and I'm a licensed lay minister or reader in this parish. This week we're following some of the lectionary readings for the week but also considering the lives of some of the Christians who are specially remembered this week. And today our prayers and thoughts will be interwoven with meditations of the day. O oh Lord, open our lips and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. O oh God, make speed to save us O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Teach me to do what pleases you, for you are my God. Let your kindly spirit lead me on a level path. And our reading today is going to be from Psalm 72. Now, this psalm is known as a royal psalm. That is, it's a psalm composed either by or for King David or one of his descendants. But some of the truths could only apply to an eternal king, the messianic king, Jesus. The psalm has six main sections, and I'm going to read each section in turn, and then comment briefly on that section. So Psalm 72, verses 1 to 4. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son, May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy and crush the oppressor. So a prayer for the royal leader, that he may judge the people rightly. Verse 1, the king does not make up his own judgments, but his legal system has to be based on God's judgment and righteousness. Give the king your justice. Then there's a prayer that the king will judge all all people justly, and that includes the poor. And a request that the nation would have righteous prosperity, and that prosperity includes the environment, the hills, and the mountains as well. And it says, may the king defend the rights of the poor, especially their children, and may their oppressors get their comeuppance. So let us pray for our leaders today. Give our leaders, O oh God, a sense of your justice and righteousness that true prosperity may be spread about the nation, especially that the poor and children may be provided for, and that our mountainous regions, whether in the Lake District or the Grampians, Snowdonia or the Mountains of Morn, may truly prosper, O God. Amen. Section 2, verses 5 to 7. May they fear you while the sun endures, and as long as the moon, 
throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. Yes, the author of the psalm says, may the people of God fear and honour you, the king, forever. We also need to note that the expressions that describe forever, that is as long as the sun and the moon endure, could only be fulfilled by an eternal king, the Messiah. And under his rule, the righteous will flourish and peace will abound. And the prayer is that the presence of the king would freshen things up. The righteous and not the wicked prosper. And the land have peace. So our prayer. Lord. May your people fear and honour you throughout all times and in the changes of these days. And we pray that in our land, the righteous may flourish and peace abound as long as the sun shines. Amen. Section three is verses eight to eleven. May he, that is the king, have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. Now this part of the passage looks forward to a worldwide kingship. From the Mediterranean Sea to the Persian Gulf. From the river Euphrates in the east to Spain in the west and as far south as the Horn of Africa. So the dominion of this king is seen as extending beyond the land of Israel, but over all the known world at that time, the non-Jewish nations would recognise the Jewish king. That surely should be our prayer today. For the nations of the world. Lord, we pray that all nations of the world would serve you and that all rulers of the nations would acknowledge you as the true Lord. May that be true from the furthest east, from the Euphrates to the furthest west, even beyond Tarshish and the whole of Africa. Amen. Part of the character of the reign of the king is described in verses 12 to 14. For he delivers the needy when he calls, the poor and him who has no helper. He has a pity on the weak and the needy, and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life and precious is their blood in his sight. The true king takes pity on the needy, the weak, the poor, the oppressed. In society in those days, and in society today, we still have the poor, the weak and the needy, and they are important to God. 
and so they should be important to us. In the last couple of years, the mantra Black Lives Matter has become part of our national consciousness. In my early 70s, I was faced with a situation where an inner city school in Birmingham, the vast majority of whose students are from a BAME background, that is non-white European, couldn't find a teacher to teach A-level physics. So I went back to teaching part-time. My answer to why I did this was this. All lives matter to God. What is your reaction to verses 12 and 14? Lord, we pray for the needy, the weak and the poor in our society. And we especially remember the work of the Birmingham City Mission as they seek to bring your truth and your pity on those who have no helper in our great city. Amen. <clears throat> Section 5, verses 15 to 17. Long may the king live. May gold of Sheba be given to him. May prayer be made for him continually and blessings invoked for him all the day. May there be abundance of grain in the land. On the tops of the mountains may it wave. May its fruit be like Lebanon. May your people blossom in the cities like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever and his fame continue as long as the sun. May people be blessed in him. All nations call him blessed. The psalmist speaking of the king says, may his reign result in true national prosperity. From gold in the bank, to rich agricultural harvests and may people be blessed in him. And the limits of time and place for this ruler's blessing can only come from the Messiah. However, on a human level, if we think of the words of verse 15, invoke blessings for him all the day, we could say this gives a biblical justification to say, God save the queen every morning. And as verse 17 speaks of the king's name enduring forever, we know that the only king for whom this is possible is King Jesus. Lord, we pray for true national prosperity. Yes, Lord, that our national gold reserve may increase due to profitable trading and agricultural output increase profitably, but even more that people in the cities might blossom and your name be praised for all generations. Verses 18, 19, and 20 are a sort of benediction, a closing of this prayer, but also a closing of the whole of this section of prayers and psalms. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things, Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. 
So we have a benediction, thanking God for his blessings and his nature. And this benediction may be thought of as an appropriate end to this psalm and also an appropriate end to this section of the book of Psalms, which is Psalm 42 to 72. So did you see throughout this psalm how sections of it could apply to a great king in the Davidic line? But some of the thoughts were so embracing that they could only apply to the messianic king, King Jesus, in whose name we are meeting this morning. Amen. Now we're thinking in our wider church thoughts today of two brothers called Constantine and Methodius, who lived in northern Greece. They were both well-educated and multilingual, and they felt God's call to, the, to missionary work in the area of the Balkans, and in 860 went as missionaries to the country we call today Ukraine or so my notes tell me. And doesn't that country need our prayers today? They later went to an area called Moravia, where they were good linguists, knew the language, were good administrators. They were known for three things. There was difficulty between different religious traditions in the area, Catholic and Orthodox, but they always sought the unity of God's people. So may we. Then there was the problem of the language to be used in services. Should it be Greek or should it be in Latin? The Orthodox in the East would say Greek. The Catholics in the West would say Latin. They said neither. It should be in the language of the people of the region. They believed there was no special Christian language, but people should learn and worship in their own language. On a trip to Rome, the younger brother, Constantine, took ill. And as he knew he was dying, he entered a monastery and took a new monastic name for the last 50 days of his life. The name was Cyril. His memory was so honoured that the name of the alphabetic system he devised is still named after him, Cyrillic. Not a bad legacy for a name of 50 days. Later, his brother Methodius returned to the Balkans to a very difficult political situation. And he continued his ministry and con translated most of the scriptures into Slavonic before he died. We should honour such men even in our own day. And I'm going to finish this account unusually by giving an extended quote from a translation of the old Slavonic text called The Life of Cyril. And as we hear his words invoking God's protection on the people of the Balkans of his day, so we pray for the people of the Balkans, especially Ukraine, in our day. 
Constantine, already burdened by many hardships, became ill. At one point during his extended illness, he experienced a vision of God and began to sing this verse from the Psalms. My spirit rejoices and my heart exalts, for we shall go into the house of the Lord. Afterwards, he remained dressed in the vestments that would be venerated later, and he rejoiced for an entire day, saying, From now on, I am not the servant of the emperor or of any man on earth, but of almighty God alone. Before I was dead, but now I am alive and I shall live together. Amen. The following day he assumed the monastic habit and took the religious name Cyril. He lived the life of a monk for 50 days. When the time came for him to set out from this world to the peace of the heavenly homeland, he prayed to God with his hands outstretched and his eyes filled with tears. O oh Lord my God, you have created the choirs of angels and spiritual powers. You have stretched forth the heavens and established the earth, creating all that exists from nothing. You hear those who obey your will and keep your commands in holy fear. Hear my prayer now and protect your faithful people, for you have established me as their unsuitable and unworthy servant. Keep them free from harm and all the worldly cunning of those who blaspheme you. Build up your church and gather all into unity. Make your people known for the unity and profession of their faith. Inspire the hearts of your people with your word and your teaching. You called us to preach the gospel of your Christ and to encourage them to lives and works pleasing to you. I now return to you, your people, your gift to me. Direct them with your powerful right hand and protect them under the shadow of your wings. May all praise and glorify your name, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. And we would pray that prayer too for Ukraine today. And once Cyril had exchanged the gift of peace with everyone, he said, Blessed be God, who did not hand us over to our invisible enemy, but freed us from his snare and delivered us from perdition. He then fell asleep in the Lord at the age of 42. Now today is also a special day when we think about love. And we'll have as our closing meditation a 400 year old meditation on the theme of love by a mystical Christian poet, George Herbert, about a meal of two people in love. Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin, but quick-eyed love observing me grow slack from my first entering in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he, I, the unkind, ungrateful, ah, oh, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? 
truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. And may that love be with you and us all this day. And so let us close our prayers this Monday with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours. Emerembi, nemerembi, now and forever. Amen. So we look forward to meeting again, God willing, tomorrow morning. God bless. <laughs>